No, no, actually, in not. certain ways, we did follow the dotted line. We carried a postcard up the wall with us that we bought it. And <laughs> true. And we'd get it out and we'd study it every night. Yeah. <laughs> did you try to stick to snow or snow or rock or what? Uh, you try to. We tried to take the Whatever easiest way. way. The easiest. <laughs> Generally, the snow and ice is the easiest on a climb of this sort. Yeah. Uh, root finding on a wall is it's so big. Okay, it's almost it's a mile high, and certainly a, it's even longer than a mile wide. But the face is huge, and we had to memorize a lot of key features on the mountain so that we knew where we were, where we had to go, where we had to bivouac. And I think I was going to talk about some of the root finding later on, but you you rely on a few things: rot flu and the ice fields are kind of a thing. We'll, I'll talk a little bit more yeah. about it later. This is Harry jumaring up the difficult crack section that I've just previously led. I was very glad Keith got to lead that one. You can really get an idea of how steep and how severe the wall is and how heavily snowed up it is. You'll notice the horizontal nature of the cracks over in the right upper right hand corner. This is one reason why the Eiger has such bad protection on it. Horizontal cracks do not lend themselves good for this kind of climbing. This here is the Hintastasser Traverse in summer. This is taken off a 1952 French ascent, <coughs> I think the Rubafe ascent. And this is how we found it that winter, completely snowed up, completely iced up, whereas they, it normally is rock. Here's a hero shot for Harry's mother. We had to <laughs> stage this one. I made sure I got this one right. Mm -hmm. about five it gives you a good idea of how we climbed on this thing, and our, in the, a good idea of our clothing and our uh, technique. You'll notice here, very good shot of Harry's crampons down here with his front points in. He uses two ice tools out to hang on to, and he has a spare ice tool on the, on the back of his pack in case we break one, which we eventually broke three. Fully suited up in a Gore-Tex windsuit. Okay. Yeah. Now, what Harry's doing here is he's digging like a mole for a rope <laughs> that's fixed. Because of the bad history of the Eiger, Especially on the Hintastasser Traverse, a rope has been permanently left here, and it pretty much gets changed every couple years. 1935, I believe it was, no, 37, a team went across the Hintastasser Traverse, got a storm higher up on the wall, and decided to retreat. They got to, back to the Hintastasser, and because it is a traverse, it is only possible to go one way on it. It wasn't possible to retreat back the opposite way unless a rope was fixed across it, and they perished. So Harry has dug the rope out, and you can see him hanging on it here. We still use our main belay rope conventionally. I'm still belaying Harry uh, from the side over here, but he hangs off the fixed line that was left in place and uses it as an assist to get across until he gets to this point. Now it took him about, oh, maybe five or ten minutes to get about 80 feet across the 120-foot traverse until he stumbles across a section of rope that has been cut two-thirds of the way through took him another hour and a half to finish the last 30 feet. <laughs> <laughs> this shot here has a lot of air. It's really a, a neat part of the wall because you kind of go across the traverse and then you end up on a real steep uh, kind of a ret or almost face type ridge. And it's real steep. It's like about 3,000 feet of air all the way down to the Grindelwald below. And it really gives you an idea of how steep this mountain is in a lot of places. This is the result of not leaving that fixed line across the traverse. This is the last of the Hintastasser party to die, Tony Kurtz. Since they couldn't retreat the, uh, the Hintastasser traverse, they had to go straight down. And the wall was so steep and their rope so short that they couldn't touch back into uh, to rock to, to re-anchor their ropes. So they <coughs> ended up hanging from the very ends of their rope, and that's where they died. He was so close to a rescue, the rescuers could get so close to him while he was alive that to cut his body down, all they had to do was tie a knife to a 10-foot pole and reach up and uh, uh, you know, cut the rope. That's how close they actually were to him. They were talking with him, telling him what to do. He tried to untangle a strand of rope and tie it together with one arm because his other arm was frozen. And uh, it was a really grim thing to be so close and yet so, uh, so far away from a rescue possibility. So 
For our second night, we managed to make it as far as the swallow's nest, given its name, because in summer, apparently, we're told there's a lot of swallows around. And you do, again, have a very good bird's eye view of the village below, the Klein and Scheideg ski area, which is very good for skiing, actually. This here is Klein and Scheideg. This is train tracks running up to it. Because this is a ski area, you can see, and when the acoustics are right, you can hear the skiers down below. And sometimes you can actually hear people talking in a normal uh, tone of voice. You could hear people talking, laughing, whooping, and hollering. I could hear Keith kind of moaning and groaning and crying, <laughs> mumbling certain things. What am I doing here? And stuff. <laughs> oh, I think hey, we're changing, changing carousels here. We got someone up. Great, good. OK, so again, for the second evening, looking due west again, perfect sunset. Uh, drinking liquids. We didn't get the tent out here either. The weather looked so good. This is where we made one of our first mistakes on the wall because uh, in the night, a lot of spin drift, snow avalanches had come down. Not a lot, but just enough to land on your bag. They land on your bag, it starts to get a little moist. And it was a very bad mistake because eventually, by the time we got to the top, our bags were completely wet. And when they weren't wet, they were completely frozen. So it was a very serious mistake not to wrap ourselves up in the tent, actually. Using like or we would now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. This Down bags. Go ahead. Go this ahead. is Harry on the uh, the ice hose, a uh, technically hard ice pitch, uh, near vertical, inch thick ice overlaying rock. Connection between the first and the second ice field. The ice hose lies in this area right down here. Our second night on the wall was spent about here. We're aiming for this which is a 1,200 foot slightly rising traverse to the left across the second ice field to our third night on the wall in the death bivouac. You asked about root finding earlier. Can I see that light and I'll just briefly say. So there's some, some key features. Obviously, you're looking for the first ice field, then you're looking for the second ice field, then you're looking for the death bivouac, which is the connection to the third ice field. The ramp is very obvious, six, 700 <coughs> feet ramp. This is a summer shot, by the way. And then, of course, you've got the traverse of the gods. The white spider is very obvious. Root finding in here in the exit cracks. There's a few dead ends here that if you start up them, eventually you'll hit uh, direct aid or real hard ice climbing. Uh, you certainly want to avoid anything hard at that point at all costs. By the way, a good shot of the west flank, the descent route on the right. You'll notice here how there's not much ice. It's just real narrow ribbons of ice, barely attached to the rock. And this is real tricky climbing because if you hit in too hard with your axes or hit in too hard with your feet, you shatter all the ice and there's nothing to get your tools into. You can't hang on the ice. You're then forced to climb on rocks. With your crampons on, you're a lot better off on ice. So you've got to be very delicate, very meticulous. This is why we take our packs off for the hard, uh, technical, steep uh, sections of the face. A summer shot of the second ice field. This also is taken off the 52 French guide ascent. You'll notice. Classic French technique here. This is a form of ice climbing, a technique. And uh, early in the days, they didn't have 12-point crampons, meaning they couldn't face directly into the ice the way we can, because they didn't have front points on their crampons. They had to really exaggerate angles on their feet and try to get their, the, flat, the flat part of their crampons uh, onto the ice. And this is a very difficult technique to use, especially with heavy packs that one may be carrying up there. And uh, I'm glad for the modern inventions of 12-point crampons. Here you can see Harry front pointing across the uh, second ice field. Two tools out, front points in. Notice the black ice on here, the darker colored uh, section of ice to the right of Harry. What this is, <coughs> is ice that is so hard that when you hammer your tool in, it's like hitting asphalt. This is where we broke our first ice axe, or Harry broke the first ice axe. <laughs> <laughs> OK. We're heading for the Death Bivouac, which is directly above me, right up in this area here. We're going to, as you can see, we're not going to gain much elevation this day, but we're going to get up to a major section of the wall. This traverse going across the second ice field was very time consuming for us. And the people who were watching us with telescopes down below were concerned, we found out later, because it took us so long. The reason it took us so long is because the ice was so hard. It was delicate. It was brittle. 
it was very nervous because our points and our ice axes weren't penetrating deeply into the medium. So it's nerving. You're never totally feeling relaxed or controlled. You'll also notice the rope kind of going out in space there. There's no protection. You know, we would do 300 foot lengths, okay? Four, four rope lengths, 300 foot each across without any protection at all. We had, we put occasionally one ice screw in between. And then of course, at the end of a rope length, you'd anchor with one ice screw and then you'd put in both your ice axes as backups for the anchor. And then the second person would come across. It took us about, oh, six or seven hours to do this. In summer, when the ice is softer, or when it, you know, it's, you're lighter, you don't have heavy packs the way you do in winter, you can get across this in almost, you know, sometimes an hour or so. It was very time consuming for us. Here's a picture taken by Ian Clough of a ill-fated British and Swiss climber, uh, Tom Mordegger and, uh, no, Tom Crothers and a, a Swiss man, I think his name was Mordegger. They were swept off the face by a rock fall that came down from the white spider. They were in the wrong section of the wall at the wrong time. One doesn't want to be on the second ice field late in the afternoon, which is where they are right now. This Over photograph there. was taken by Chris Bonington. This is connection between the second ice field and the death bivouac. What this was, was dead vertical sugar snow, a different medium to climb on than either rock or ice. One puts their ice tools away and you punch your arms into the snow and bear hug it and hope that everything stays together. And it was very near dead vertical. It's very tricky. Occasionally, you'll have to make a stance, an actual foothold for your feet. You'll take snow from below or the side, pack it into the uh, slope, take another handful, pack it in the snow, and hopefully make a little footstep for yourself. And then you do the same with your left foot. It's amazing. The Weiger is so big and it's such a vertical relief gain that you encounter different conditions uh, every so many feet. And this is why it's such a great climb and such a, a this climb that keeps you alive and really excited all the time because you're using different techniques just about every other lead on it almost. It's amazing. This is arriving at the death bivouac. You can see that on this particular pitch, there wasn't much protection on the rope. It only takes one jog, which means there's only one anchor point on that, uh, on that lead. This is a 300 foot rope too. This is one of the classic bear hug pitches here. This shot here has a little bit of history to it. In 1966, when John Harlan was attempting his directissima with the other members, uh, he was jumaring up very close to the Agarwan window, the Stolenok window, which is the window very far left-hand corner of the face. He spotted down below him this leg, Spanish leg here actually, sticking out of the snow and ice. And he went inside and went back down to Grindelwald and, re and just, you know, briefly mentioned in the bar, I imagine, that he saw a leg on the face. Well, that wasn't good enough. In order to set uh, the mortuary records correct or whatever, the uh, coroners needed proof that this was a body or that this was a part of a body up on the mountain. So they sent Harlan back out the windows, had him rappel down to this leg, strap it to his rucksack on the outside, back up, climb in through the windows, take the train down to climb Scheidegg with this leg on the outside of his pack. <laughs> Presented it to the proper authorities. The story has it the boot didn't fit, though. Something like that. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> okay. This is the second ice field. Third. Oh, excuse me. Third ice field. This is the last point on the wall where it's reasonable to retreat. After this, it becomes uh, nearly impossible. What we're aiming for is the ramp, which is this big snow snowed up uh, rock band, <coughs> rock system here, gully. We figured, and we had, you know, you might think that because it's called the ramp, it's a cruise. You know, you figure a ramp is just low <laughs> angle. It's not. It was a lot harder than we had anticipated, and it turned out that there was new, flood. you'll notice there's new snow here. It, it snowed a little bit the night before, and it covered up a lot of the key uh, holds, rock holds, covered up some of the fixed protection that exists there. And uh, it was created, it was made for a very difficult climb for us up the ramp. Now this picture has a little slightly foggy quality to it. That's because we've just been hit by a harmless but relatively huge spindrift avalanche. I can remember where I took this picture from. It was snowing and I was about 600 feet underneath the white spider. The white spider funnels everything into it and then uh, excretes it to right below. And I just happened to set up the belay below. There was no other possibility. 
and I, I take the camera out and there'd be all sorts of snow and uh, peanut shells and stuff on the lens and I just take my mitt and scrape it off and try to get a picture of something. Uh, so it's a, it's a, you know, sometimes a hard proposition to always take photographs on a climb of this nature. By the way, we kept our camera in a granola bag, so we're surprised that we had any pictures turned out at all. <laughs> when I got over, I had to take a picture of the terror of Keith's face <laughs> after, he, after he looked up and saw that we had to go up the ramp. And the condition that the ramp was in. See, I was very good at hiding my fear, actually. The ramp was very difficult, and it tri actually was probably the technically the most difficult section of the wall. We were both pushing our limits to the absolute maximum here. Okay, this in, uh, is what is called the waterfall pitch. It gets its name, of course, from the summer conditions. In winter, it is uh, a slightly overhanging snow couloir. The snow is sticking on the underneath sides of the overhang. So this took a different series of techniques. And they consisted of simply chopping the snow out from below. Now what happens when you chop the snow out from below is you end up with Volkswagen sized blocks of snow sitting in your lap, which you have to jettison onto Harry who's hanging 50 feet below me. <laughs> you ever try to dodge a Volkswagen <coughs> while you're tied to a rock? Yeah, right. <laughs> this is direct aid in here too. It's slightly <laughs> overhanging. You'll notice this was climbed with rucksacks on. Direct aid, uh, for, to explain that a little bit, is where it's no longer to climb the rock physically so that you, you climb it uh, mechanically. You hammer your pitons in, your nuts in, or whatever uh, means of anchoring you're using at this particular time, and you hang from those. You don't climb the rock, you hang from your technical climbing equipment. That's what we're doing in this section. Keith has excavated approximately 30, about 10 and 15 meters of snow out of this section here, which was deposited uh, immediately on my entire body. It was terrible. Volkswagen sized chunks. I'm going to get him back for it. I always get sad. Okay, the kind of the normal procedure at the end of every rope length or at the end of every pitch is to neaten all your gear and get it uh, organized for the next pitch that's coming up. Obviously, if it's going to be all ice, you can afford to leave a few pins behind or a few friends. You don't have to take a certain amount of gear with you. Uh, so that's a shot of Keith here kind of going through it. Uh, this picture Harry took. Good picture? <laughs> Actually, I decided to keep this in. I, we were going to take it out. But this is the only picture we have of where we slept. We slept on this ledge that I'm standing on. It's approximately the size of a bar stool. Not the most comfortable night, but at least some place to spend it. This is the only place on the wall where we couldn't get our tent set up. Because of, we, we had to get going usually at 5 or 6 in the morning. Couldn't take pictures then, just the first light. And then it was usually uh, just getting dark when we got our bivouac tent set up or where our baby was set up. And we never bothered. We were always, I feel too excited or hyper or scared or whatever to actually take pictures of our bivouac setups at that point. Wish we had, but there were other things on our mind. A bivouac is just what a climber calls uh, camping out. They're, they're interchangeable pretty much. A bivouac generally is on steeper ground. <laughs> okay. I'll give you an idea of what's happening here. You'll notice some key features. This is the shattered pillar here. Pardon me, the flat iron. The route generally goes up in this section here. You have several possibilities. You're going up into this area here. Our first night was spent just around in here at the wet cave. Second day, going up through the difficult cracks across the Hennestoisa Traverse. This is a major feature of the rote flu. By the way, one of the Japanese routes goes right up this thing, overhanging. Onto the first ice field, another major root finding section, up the ice hose to the second ice field of the death bivouac for our third night. Ways. This is the initial section of the Traverse of the Gods. And here's Harry into the more technical parts of the Traverse. You'll notice that his rope runs slack here, meaning that he doesn't have a whole lot of protection. In fact, he doesn't have any. <laughs> very exposed, very technical here. You'll also notice clouds coming up from below. The weather is starting to change for us right now. Our attitudes are beginning to change too. We're beginning a little bit more frightened. Uh, having the weather come in, also we're trying to climb a little bit faster because we're getting a little bit low on food. A summer shot of the uh, Traverse of the Gods taken in just about the same area. Conditions aren't too much different. Uh, you're high enough up on the wall now that it stays frozen pretty much year round. You notice how, uh, oh, oops, oh, I did the wrong picture. <laughs> Okay. Oh, never mind. We'll skip it. Okay, another picture giving a little more idea of the exposure below us. Very, very steep section of wall. In this section here, that's called the Traverse of the Gods, they have kind of a Swiss 
Swiss saying that with this old Swiss fellow, before we started up the Iger, we started across the skiing down to the base of it. And this guy comes up to us and he goes, hey, you guys don't want to climb that. He goes, listen, if you must, come back in summer, but you don't want to climb that thing in winter. He goes, look, go to my hotel up there. I have a waitress. She's very pretty. You guys get her together with her, get some of her friends. And <laughs> Keith and I kind of looked at each other and said, yeah, maybe we ought to consider that, actually. <laughs> Anyway, he told us the traverse of God has kind of a Swiss, the traverse of the gods has sort of a Swiss meaning, or what is it? I forget. A little saying that the Swiss have about it, and if I can get this just right. Um, on the traverse of the gods, if you're not uh, extremely careful, you'll soon be joining them, or something like that. So this is what he tells us before we're going on. I believe climb. it now. <laughs> of course, the weather's changing here, and now we're completely enclosed in clouds. This is the last point on the wall where our friends down below who are watching us, our support crew, would see us for about the next three days. Turned out that the, uh, they thought that when the storm came in, we were still in this area when it finally had cleared. And they were very surprised to see us uh, bivouacked on the summit. They were even more surprised to see us bivouacked on the summit when, uh, when they found out that we had been there for two days, waiting out the storm. I put this picture in here to kind of explain something. This is the west flank. This is the descent route. You go up the north wall and then to the summit and down. You'll notice it's about 45 to 65 degrees, maybe not 65, but it's a perfect slope for avalanches. If there's any new snow, this slope is a trigger. It'll, it'll go and it continues to avalanche uh, all during the winter regularly after a storm and even during. The north wall is notorious for forming its own weather and that picture really uh, explains that you know, very well, I think. What Keith's doing here is he's kind of searching for protection. And we've put this series of photographs in there to remind us to tell you that you've got to kind of weigh how much time you want to spend putting protection in on an alpine climb and how much time you want to spend in going quickly. Obviously, you're wasting, not wasting time, but you're using up hours in the day if you have to scratch away to try to get an ice screw or a piton in or whatever. So, you have a mental battle raging. How much time should I take to secure myself <coughs> safely or my partner? And meanwhile, I'm taking these pictures down here going, let's go, Keith, you know, hurry up. And he's going, Harry, you know, forget, you know, shut up. I'm taking my time. And you got to have this little mental battle with yourself, which really begins to wear on you. For one, you're cold. You're anxious to get off because of the storm. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that can uh, affect that decision. So finally, very often in the climb, you just can't get it. And you've got to continue on across. Traverse of the Gods is approximately three to four, it's actually 400 feet traversed just about uh, due west and to the right. Very delicate totally climb. horizontal. You don't gain any altitude from it. You just climb sideways. And in a certain way, it's frustrating because you're so anxious to get off the wall, and yet you're not really gaining any altitude. Fourth night spent right here. One, two, yeah, fourth night. And then the Traverse of the Gods, where those last section of pictures are taken, right in here been a lot of accidents up in this area. We're heading over, of course, to the White Spider, which is the book that Heinrich Herrer wrote. And then, of course, going, aiming up for the next uh, day or whenever we can get there to the exit crack. This is a picture off the Harlan Derek Kissmer out taken from a uh, helicopter, I believe. You can see a climber in the upper right-hand corner on the White Spider. This man here is Jumaring fixed lines. The Traverse of the Gods comes in, this is the ramp ice field, this is the ramp, well, it's just out of the picture, and they come in kind of from the right here, just around like this. Very steep in here. Chris Bonington in 1962, chopping steps up the white spider. These men chop steps, whereas we uh, front pointed the entire climb. This is a different uh, series of techniques, uh, front pointing being the more modern of the two. It's a very tiring and very fatiguing thing to chop steps up this climb. I can't even consider doing this without 12-point uh, crampons. Besides, it's very dangerous. There's certain sections you do not want to be hanging around and chopping away. But the desire in these men to climb this mountain back then was incredible. And they would, you know, attempt anything, really. Looking down the white spider from our, uh, I believe, fifth bivouac in a small clearing in the storm, we're looking straight down into about 5,000 feet of airspace. It's kind of interesting here. In order to uh, cope with the cold and also uh, with uh, each other and various other things up there, 
your mind begins to wander a lot, and it's a regular thing that after a few days into a climb of this nature, you start to hallucinate a lot when you're sitting there bivouacking, when you're trying to sleep. And I've actually done studies of this with other athletes who you know, are pushing their body and mind to the mo maximum. And uh, I can remember our minds would wander back and forth and stuff. And we'd share these hallucinations with each other. It's like you could kind of tune in and out of them. It's a real thing. We're shivering a lot now. Our bags are kind of wet. So I think it's just pretty much a way of coping with uh, the situation that we are in. So your mind begins to wander to other, other <laughs> things. <laughs> 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 At this point, we would rather be in other places, to be very honest with you. I mean, the climb's great and everything, but there are other sections of the world that we would rather be in at this time. I can remember regularly, Keith would say, Harry, I'm never climbing again. You know, it would just be this constant conversation we have. I would pay any amount of money to be off that climb at that particular time. Now, this is Harry about 30 feet away from me in a blinding whiteout snowstorm. There's nothing wrong with our camera. This is how much snow is in the air at this particular time. We don't have to dwell on this photograph too long, but just to kind of put it in perspective, it's been snowing now for a day and a half, a lot of new <coughs> snow developing. The exit cracks are so steep, though, that it doesn't you know, uh, stay a lot, so it just always is falling. And occasionally going up the exit cracks, there was a constant, say, waterfall of snow. And I can remember Jumaring up, and the snow would get in the little teeth of the clamps and the, all of a sudden, I can remember a couple of times, I just start to slip down in the clamps. You have to back up a lot with no, uh, figure eight knots. And uh, same with leading. Keith had a brilliant pitch where it, you know, there's just avalanche coming down all the time while he's trying to lead up. And it stacks in front of you, it gets on your feet, and then piles, piles up. And eventually, you kind of force back. You got to let him go. It's a, it was really a horrendous thing in here. It's very steep and unprotected. The exit cracks are funnel shaped. And so it accentuates any snow that you do get on the wall. These are taken again off 1952 ascent of the wall. Actually, I think this one here was taken off Harar's ascent. In the exit crack. Their conditions weren't too much different than winter. Very snowed up, very iced up conditions. At this point in the exit cracks, taking pictures for us wasn't of a very important concern. Uh, in fact, I can remember, I already said this, but we pull it out of the granola bag and the lens would be all screwed up and it'd be you know, chips of peanut shells and M&Ms kind of smudged on the lens and just take a photograph anyway, you know, and hope that it came out. Uh, it was amazing that so many of them did, actually. Shot here of the bivouac for the, uh, one of the rescue attempts on the face, summit bivouac of these guys growing up. This is sort of a similar ledge that we would try to uh, get for our tent. And on the face, we never really got one quite that good. Okay gone back to a summer shot here to, to tell a little story, kind of give you an idea of what's happening with us. We bivouacked for our fifth night right above the white spider here, uh, hanging from ice screws on a ledge uh, about, oh, it must have been two feet by two feet wide. We had to chop it out out of the ice. It took us about two hours to chop the ledge out, and that's where we broke, or I keep make sure I say I broke uh, the third ice axe. And uh, I was just chopping away and just disintegrated. So we threw it off. I wouldn't let him touch my ice axes after this climb. <laughs> and we broke all three. We, we started to bivouac and uh, crawled into the tent. And it was such cramped quarters, you know, and that we couldn't, have, we couldn't set the stove down. So we were brewing up with the stove in my lap. And we, we should tell the, the stove story, I guess. We should do that. All right. Well, we're right up here backtrack now. Backtrack just a bit. To set the setting for this, Harry and I were bivouacked for our fifth night on the wall, hanging from ice screws on a small ledge about the size of uh, the chairs that you're sitting on. Each of us had our own little pedestal to sit on. Hanging inside our tent with our sleeping bags on, with a stove in our lap, brewing up, cooking. And the fuel bottle, the <coughs> pressurized gas bottle, popped off the bottom of the stove. So we had a, a pressurized gas bottle spewing gasoline and a hot lit burner burning instantly, this tent is full of flames. Now we're hanging inside the tent in sleeping bags, hanging from the screws, quite literally hanging off our harnesses on these screws. It was quite a, a, a Houdini act to get the flaming gas bottle out of, the, uh, out of the tent without burning the tent down, burning ourselves, or jettisoning the stove. We couldn't afford to lose the stove. We did jettison the fuel bottle with a pump in it. Of course, we had two fuel bottles and two pumps on the climbs, so we had ourselves covered pretty well. It's a shame 
that there was such a bad storm out because that bottle must have looked like a huge rocket going down the wall. And you know, as I threw it out, I went, man, it's too bad no one could see this because it just must have looked grand. It was shooting the flame about four feet long out of the top of it. <laughs> Probably <laughs> It was great. So our heartbeats, you know, pulses eventually reached around 150 there, kind of got back. Okay, then the next day, we continued on up the exit cracks, and while well, we made it to the summit ridge here, which uh, at about, oh, must have been noon or so, and it was, it was really a relief to get there, but we couldn't stand up because the wind was blowing so hard. I estimated probably between 60 and 80 miles per hour just cruising across the south, uh, the south face. And this is where, uh, as soon as Keith got on the ridge, he said, Harry, he's just taking one of my contact lenses out. And he just lifted his goggles out for a minute and just went right in and got him. So it was obviously canned any kind of further progress for that day. He stopped, excavated the platform for the tent, set it up, and began to bivouac. Beginning to bivouac, all that means is you pull the frozen sleeping bag out of the pack, get in it, and pretend that it's keeping you warm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. So, here we are bivouacking, we're brewing up, and Keith goes, Harry, we just climbed the north wall of the Arger. Let's celebrate. And I said, you're right, let's celebrate. So we did. We ate two and a half days worth of food in one pot of food. <laughs> <laughs> Foolish mistake. Absolutely foolish, because we still had, we didn't know, but we still would be two and a half, two out full days before we'd actually get down. Normally in summer, from the summit, it's only about four and a half, five hours down to the train station. From here to here took us about six hours, crawling on our hands and knees on this knife edge ridge. We made it's, it up. Go ahead. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Well, go ahead. We had to crawl across a knife edge ridge with a 6,000 feet of exposure on one side and about 4,000 on the uh, south side. To do this, it wasn't possible to belay conventionally. So as we were crawling along the, the ridge, we agreed that if one of us were to fall off one side, so it's a rope together, the other climber would jump off the opposite side. <laughs> we call this a jump belay, and it's completely hypothetical. <laughs> Don't practice it, please. As of yet. <laughs> jump belay. We made it here, and I was nominated by some, I don't know how, or actually probably pushed off in a sense, to start down the west flank in about two feet, maybe three feet of new snow. And I, I'd been down uh, about 10 or 20 meters, and the slope cut out from underneath me, and I was taken up uh, just a little over my chest in this kind of avalanche. Fortunately, I had a belay on, I managed to get kind of to the surface, didn't go very far, dejectedly climbed back up to Keith. We both realized that we had to spend another night on the summit without food, and that we were in, you know, in a sense, trapped. To try to go down the west flank in the conditions, aside from the fact we couldn't see more than 20, 30 meters, was foolish. It would be absolute suicide. And we were very worried that night because we would have to do something in the next few days. Without food, uh, you know, you don't have any calories to burn and you start to get cold extremities, which basically amounts to frostbite over a period of hours. Actually, we did have a tiny bit of food left. We had quite a bit of gasoline, so we still had hot liquids we could make and tea and sugar and just a small amount of stuff to nibble on. But basically, our food supplies were done with. So that evening, continued to storm, and then it let up. And the next morning, it was a miracle. We just had the most beautiful day that you could possibly imagine. And I've never been so happy to see the kind of weather that we had. Now, the night before, late in, in the morning, the wind had gusted up to probably around 80 to 100 miles an hour. It quit snowing. The west flank was scoured clean of all snow and ice. The day before, Harry tried to go down it, and it avalanched on him. Now, it's devoid completely of any snow that could avalanche. It's down to bare rock and bare ice. This is, uh, for us, a set, uh, comparable to, say, uh, the Lord opening the Red Sea for Moses. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Alep Glacier one of the biggest glaciers in Europe, beautiful mountains here, and also part of the summit ridge on the Eiger. You can see the knife edge characteristics that it does have. Summit our bivouac bivouac. on the summit here, borrow this. Go. Uh, you'll notice our tent here. This is the only picture we do have of it. It looks somewhat like a pup tent cut in half. It has fiberglass wands that blouse it out. It's designed to be set up on a very steep ice wall. You cut a small edge into the wall and just set it up. It doesn't stick out triangular, it's, it lies with the angle of slope, and this sloughs off avalanches. 
It's designed purely for technical mountain climbing, and it's in very limited production, needless to say. You notice we keep a very neat campsite. This is our climbing rope. So is this our climbing rope. This is our climbing rope. And this here, I believe, is our climbing rope. As well, that's our climbing rope, and that's our climbing rope. <laughs> oh, yes, one other thing. This is Harry's broken ice axe. This is Harry's broken north wall hammer. And this is Harry's broken pterodactyl ice hammer. <laughs> You can see our tracks coming in. That is actually the summit. You can see uh, cornices coming over it. You just sort of see our tracks coming in from the right. We may even have another picture of that one. I'm not sure. We'll see. Yeah, they're up in the corner. Okay. Me, yeah. Tearing down our camp here. Um, this is one of our sleeping bags, a frozen blob of down. Rather worthless. You can see our tracks up in the upper corner along the knife-edged ridge. I couldn't Where believe that we traversed this south face. You can see it's in the sun the day before and pretty much unroped. You know, we had about oh, maybe 20 meters of rope in between us, but it was very not a good thing. And we couldn't see, though, you know, so we couldn't get an idea of the exposure. And then the next day, we looked out and saw what we came in. It was 5,000 feet of exposure down the south face of this mountain. Ignorance Incredible. is bliss, you might think. <laughs> yeah. How do you walk on those ridges? Are you right on the point? You we crawled. <laughs> Pains and knees. Walk. How, how would you walk? Uh, Very carefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's hard to say. It depends on the, uh, the uh, conditions. Normally, you would try to stay away from an edge if possible, simply because if it's cornished, it could break out from below you. You notice here that our, our tent can, is suspended from three <coughs> points, and it can be anchored from three points on an ice or a snow slope triangular in shape, so you need to cut in and then out. And this is why it's such a good thing, because it doesn't take up much room. In the background here is the monk, the, the north face of the monk, a very uh, great ice route in its own, too. Unfortunately, it's uh, overshadowed by the north wall of the Eiger, any place else in the world, and it have a history of its own, too. This picture here was taken from my mother standing on the uh, the summit ridge. She saw this and she made me swear I would never climb again. <laughs> By the way, for anybody who's a climber or even uh, it, this monk, is a beautiful mountain to climb and it looks like it has a beautiful glissading off the south face there, which is beautiful. I didn't notice any uh, uh, crevasses or any shrunds or anything in this. It looks very interesting. In the north face is beautiful. Not for glissading, though. No. <laughs> Just some of the scenic shots of the area. This is uh, the high peak back there is the Hinster Airhorn. I think the high peak of the area. Beautiful mountain. Took a few pictures kind of getting ready to go down. At this point, we were really paranoid. Although there was no clouds anywhere pretty much in sight, we were just really nervous <coughs> that the weather could change at any minute. Took these real quick, and then we started on down. Legend has it here, uh, ancient Swiss legend, that the uh, that's the Iger there, the triangular pyramid shadow. Here. And then the mountain in the center to the left is the Monk, and then the one on the left is the Jungfrau. These are the three major uh, mountains of the tourist resort. Legend has it that the uh, Monk protects the, young, the Jungfrau, the young daughter, young maiden, from the terrible Iger, or the Ogre, by uh, the German pronunciation. That day, we ended up getting on down to the bottom uh, went to the pastry shop for our first thing. We spent thirty or forty dollars there. Uh, went, then we went getting fried chicken after that, and we just kind of shoveled between chicken and pastry there for a day or two. We were eating everything we could possibly lay our hands on in any quantity. Some of the uh, local women, uh, Swiss German people, who were keeping track of us and who had sort of uh, befriended us while we were anxiously trying to nervously getting on this climb. Uh, we're very pleased with our scent, and a couple of days later we met them, or they met us in the grocery store and presented us with a very large bouquet of flowers. And in German, they couldn't speak, they came up to us and said, here, uh, for you, for Iger Nordmund. Here he ate the flowers on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it, was really, it was really actually a moving thing, uh, you know, aside from that. Uh, because they were sort of, uh, had all, we'd always bought groceries from them. They'd see us pulling out francs and stuff and kind of a low budget trip. So that was, that was pretty good, actually. And uh, then we kind of split up there, having been with each other for you know almost a month now. We're in each other's throats. I went to Italy for pizza, and Keith went to Amsterdam uh, 
for other things, drinking, things like that. <laughs> and uh, eventually made it back home. So we've sort of, I put in, we've put in this old black and white photograph of the Iger as the last shot for the evening, and so in a way as a tribute to the early pioneers and the early men who pioneered this space. It's an amazing accomplishment that back in those days that those men climbed this mountain with the gear, for one, that they had, and also the patience and drive they had was unmeasurable. And we certainly owe our ascent to them uh, a, a great deal. They pioneered this huge mountain route finding with hemp ropes, 10-point crampons, archaic ice axes and gear. They deserve the utmost in respect and admiration from the whole climbing community, and they certainly have earned it from Keith and I, and I'm sure anybody else who goes up this mountain. And I think with that, I just want to say one more thing, that yeah, this is sort of an extreme climb, and don't really get scared away from climbing. You know, it's, this is maybe the sort of maximum that Keith and I would like to do it, but you don't have to go out and do these really horrendous big routes to enjoy yourself in the mountains. You can go hiking or skiing or whatever and have just as good a time, really. So. <laughs> that sounded a little strange. <laughs> So, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'd like to thank you all very, very much for having us speak here tonight. We've enjoyed ourselves. Thank you.